Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, July the 1st, 2020. It is currently 3.43 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church. I'm here for the Wednesday evening service, but that doesn't start till 7 p.m. So, when you're at the church, you have hours of time. What do you do? Well, if you're me, you hook up the microphone, you hit the go big red go live button, and you go live on the air to talk about things happening in the world, talk about theology, Bible study, you name it. But you use that time, hopefully, to produce something that will be beneficial and challenging to those who may hear it at a later time. Now, if you are tuning in live, well, we appreciate that. Thank you for tuning in live. We do appreciate that. And as always, you can contact me at newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. Now, we have a controversial subject in front of us today. We have one that is sure to spark um, a lot of back and forth. There's going to be probably people disagreeing with me no matter what I say. But, you know, if we're honest, if we're honest, that always happens. Anytime I speak, for some reason, it's always controversial. Um, and we could talk about that all day. But I want to begin by, I think, I think I want to begin this way because I want to approach this subject um, Whenever I approach any subject, I always try to find a different way to approach it, not to just say the same thing that has been said about it so many different times by so many different people, but at least try to offer somewhat of a unique perspective, well, to make it worth your time to even listen. If I'm going to say what everyone else is saying, then what's really the point? But I want to really get us to think about this concept. As long as the Bible has existed, right, as long as, as... as long as man has existed and their relationship with God, I mean, go back before even the Bible was completed. Go back to the story of Adam and Eve. As as long as, as well, God is eternal. So God, as long as man has existed and engaged and had a, had a relationship with their creator, with God, and there's been back and forth between cre- the creation, man and woman, and God, there has been one thing that has occurred over and over and over and over and over and over again. God lays down a law, a rule, a manner of life that he calls us to adhere to. This is how you should live. This is what you should do. This is something you are not to do. This is forbidden. This is commanded. This is forbidden. I tell you to do this. I forbid you to do this over and over and over. This kind of thing, whenever whenever this kind of thing would happen, human beings always respond with either just 100% just disregarding what God has said, doing exactly the opposite of what he's commanded, or go running headlong into the thing that he has forbidden us to do. We, we constantly do that, and that is a result because we all human beings have a fallen nature. We are sinners by nature, and because we are sinners by nature, our default position, our default action is to sin. It is to disobey. But as long as we've been disobeying, as long as we have not been adhering and not listening to what God has told us to do, there's also something else we try to do. We try to come up with a way to justify our actions and to bring God into our justification. We get ready to do something and we will say, well, I don't think God believes this is wrong or I don't believe God condemns this or I don't believe God word word condemns this. We're always trying to find a way to justify our actions to believe that God is on our side, that God is not against the way we think. And, the, and what we do, we, we somehow want God on our side because if, if God is on our side, then obviously our actions are perfectly okay so we don't have to feel guilty. And uh, people were trying to do that before the scriptures existed and obviously after the scriptures have existed. Uh, men and women come along, we take the Bible and we try to change what the Bible says or we try to disregard it, especially if, if we're looking at a, a page or looking at a passage of scripture that seems to prohibit something we want to do. If there's a scripture that says, thou shalt not, we'll find a way to go, well, thou shalt not no longer applies to me. 
thou shalt not only apply then, or thou shalt not doesn't really say what it seems to say. We will find a way to get the Bible, to get God, to justify our actions where we don't have to feel bad. If you were ever a teenager in Christianity, you heard this over and over and over as teenagers trying to figure out, okay, if I hang out with my girlfriend tonight, if we, if we kiss or if we do this, is that sinful? Is that wrong? And, and somehow try to find some way to justify the action. Somehow, we always try to find a way to say, well, I don't think it's really that bad. You name it. If it's divorce, if it's remarriage, doesn't matter what it is, Christians always come along and try to find some way some way to say, well, you know, I don't really think uh, it's that bad. I don't really think God condemns that. I, 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 and well, you know, I know that one time people read the Bible and seemed to think that it, con- it prohibited women from being pastors. Well, I think, I don't think that that's true. I think women can be pastors. You name the issue. There are, have always been Christians who try to change God's word, try to bring God along to say, God is okay with this. God wants me happy. I don't believe this is true. I don't believe, I believe Christians added that or whatever. You, you, you can just, I mean, the, 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 the list of excuses and of ways of accomplishing this is very long. And it's true about you and it's true about me. Like if there's just something inside of us that when we open the scriptures and if we see something that says thou shalt not, we try to find a way to make it say, no, no, you, it's, it's okay if you do it this way, or no, that's, that's not necessarily wrong, or, or, well, I don't, I don't believe God completely condemns that, or, or I, or we always try to find a way to do it. And I, and look, let's just be honest. That, that is very, very much a part of how we are as sinners. We, we want to do what we want. And if we can justify it and can get God on our side, then we will make that happen. And we always have to be looking out for that. Now, it's, now this is very important. It's one thing when people are doing that inside the church. I mean, that's clearly where the major problem is. If it's happening inside the church, that is something that we have to speak out against and we have to condemn. If it's people outside of the church they don't really follow God. They don't really follow the Bible. They don't, uh, they don't attend church, but somehow they want to justify their actions by bringing God into it. It's kind of weird because it's like, why, why do you even care about what God thinks? You reject him. But sometimes people in the world will do so. But when the world is doing it, we just kind of like, I don't know why you even care what God thinks because you reject him. But inside the church, we need to always stop and pay close attention to it. But this is important. Whether it's in the church or whether it's outside the church, when someone comes along and tries to say, no, you're wrong, the Bible doesn't actually condemn that behavior, you're wrong, the Bible doesn't actually say that, then as Christians, we want to stop and go, wait a minute, what does the Bible actually say? Because that's very important to us, because we want to make sure that we are handling the Bible correctly, that we're translating the Bible correctly that we're interpreting the Bible correctly, that we're teaching the Bible correctly, because the church always wants to ensure that we're handling and rightly dividing the word of truth. We, we always want to ensure that. So it doesn't matter if the challenge comes from within the church or outside of the church. If someone is saying, no, 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 you've been condemning that, but the Bible doesn't actually say it. Hey, that's, that's like very important for you and I to go, wait a minute. What is going on? Let's really consider it. So we have an we have an example of that today. Someone sent this to me. I believe it was last night. It may have been the night before. I was I think I was listening to music, and all of a sudden I got a notification on my iPad, and I looked down, and I was like, "Wait, what?" And I started reading it, and I was like, "Oh boy, here we go. Here we go again." Um, someone's coming along saying, hey, you Christians or the Bible, you, all, all you Christians running around thinking the Bible condemns something. Well, you need to realize uh, that's not how the Bible originally read. It got changed. It got changed in the 1900s. So for, for a very long time, people have been handling the Bible in, a, in an incorrect way. Now, whenever I see that, one, I get bothered because I'm like, okay, here we go. So everyone's been wrong, but someone comes along and they've got it figured out or I get bothered thinking, well, wait a minute. What if we've been wrong? That would be greatly embarrassing. So 
you know what I like to do? I'm going to bring the problem to you to get you to think and get you to try to figure it out. But here is, I want to make this very clear. What we have to realize is that whatever the issue, I mean, you know the issue, but if you see the title of this episode, you know what we're getting ready to be talking about. We're going to be talking about homosexuality. But it doesn't matter if it's homosexuality, doesn't matter if it's divorce, doesn't matter if it's divorce and remarriage, doesn't matter if it's women pastors, it doesn't matter what the issue is. We always want to ensure that we approach the text of Scripture to find the truth. Whether that truth condemns us, whether that, tru- that truth excuses us, we cannot go to, into the text or approach the text with the desire to make it say what we want to say. Hey, look, if I open the Bible and it condemns me all the time, and I don't like to be condemned, but you know what? It's not for me to change the Bible. So if I don't like it and I'm unwilling to submit to it, then just abandon Christianity and abandon the Bible and walk away. I'll never understand how people can pick up a book that seems to condemn them to the left, to the right, to the back, to the front. And what their, their, their thing is, is I'm just going to make the Bible say what it doesn't say, change the Bible, still claim some form of Christianity that doesn't look anything like biblical historical Christianity. I'm like, why not just, just walk away from it? If the book condemns everything you do and how you think, don't sit there and spend all your time trying to change it. Just walk away from it. But for some reason, there's always those who still want to be associated with Christianity. They still want to call themselves Christians. And they will support every idea, no matter how contrary it is to the Bible. I will never understand why they want to remain in that system. Just leave it. It's almost like it's a... It's almost like it's a satanic plot to try to destroy and change Christianity because from a human perspective, you think you would just wash your hands and say, you know what? I don't want anything to do with a a religion, with a faith, with with a sacred text that condemns all the things that I believe are right and I believe are good and pure. Um, if, if God is going, going, if the God of the Bible is going to condemn all of those things, then I'm just going to walk away. You think that's how people would approach it, but no, they're going to stay. They're going to change it. And they're going to argue that everyone else has had it wrong for a very long time. Now, so here we are. (sighs) Homosexuality. You mentioned the word. And obviously, it's going to be controversial within the context of Christianity. Clearly, historically, Christianity has said homosexuality is a sin. To be fair, Christianity has also said premarital sex is a sin. Christianity has said adultery is a sin. Christianity has said if I look at a woman with lust, even if I never touch her, and I have those thoughts... I've committed, if I look at a woman with lust, I have committed adultery in the heart. I'm guilty of adultery. So the Bible has a very high standard for sexual morality. Basically, the biblical message has always been interpreted and always been understood like this. Man and woman, they remain pure, no sexual activity, until marriage. Then they remain faithful to one another um, and only engage in physical relationship with each other. All other sexuality is prohibited, not before marriage. I mean, it's uh, sex is only for marriage between a man and a woman. The end. That's it. All other sexual expression is condemned by Scripture. It would condemn pornography. I mean, we can go on and on and on and on and on. We could, we could go all day. I mean, that that's everyone's always understood that. Everyone that that's been a very straightforward teaching, but. There have been major attempts for a very long time to come along and say, well, you know what? The Bible doesn't actually condemn homosexuality. Now, let's just start right before we even get into the argument. Let's just start with the most obvious, like the obvious wall to being able to, to make homosexuality compatible with the Bible. There is no way you're going to tell me the Bible 
in any way, shape, or form would ever understand a marriage to be between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. No, the Bible would make it very clear. A marriage is between a man and a woman. That is clearly the biblical model. To make it any different than that is just ludicrous. There's no way you're going to find the Bible supporting the idea that a man and a man can get married or a woman and a woman can get married. Now, based off that fact alone, well, then homosexuality, as far as engaging in a physical relationship and engaged in sexual activity of a homosexual nature, guess what? The Bible's going to condemn it because it restricts all sexuality to marriage between a man and a woman. So even if you try to argue, well, the Bible doesn't actually condemn homosexuality, well, clearly it, it would condemn the practice because Sexuality is only to happen within marriage, and that's to be between a man and a woman. So even even if you try to make some argument the Bible doesn't actually condemn homosexuality, clearly the prohibition would be you can't engage in any sexual activity unless you are married, and the Bible would never allow for the marriage of a man and a man or a woman and a woman. I mean, like... That that's that's not that doesn't take a seminary education. That's not you don't need you know you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to figure that out. You don't need a degree from Harvard, Oxford, or anywhere else. You can just read the Bible and go, huh? Man, woman, come together, one flesh. All right, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. Husband and wife, male and female. That is the biblical model of marriage. No way to get around that. So even if you argue and can prove that the Bible never condemns homosexuality, it would never allow for the expression of it because all sexuality is confined to marriage, right? I know I'm repeating myself and I'm doing that on purpose because that that's the foundational principle. So whatever argument you can advance, it, it's irrelevant because that this principle this biblical truth puts up a wall against it. So you can argue all day, well, you know what? The word homosexuality doesn't belong in the Bible. It was never in the Bible until whatever year it got put there because, you know, the, someone wanted to turn the Bible into an anti-gay document. You can make all these arguments. You can't get around that basic uh, understanding, all right? So I, I want to, and so make sure if you, have, if you run into people who try to start making this argument that the Bible never condemns homosexuality, don't, don't participate in that argument at first. Go, wait a minute. You do realize the Bible restricts sexuality to the bond, to marriage. And there's no way you're going to tell me the Bible <laughs> teaches anything other than a man and a man and a, wo- a, a, man and a woman in marriage. It not, never teaches a man and a man and a woman a woman in marriage. And if they try to argue differently, then at that point, they're just being disingenuous and not being fair. And if they're going to be disingenuous and not be fair, then why why are they even trying to even handle the text of Scripture? Just move on and create your own religion and do what you want because basically you're trying to turn Christianity into your own religion. And and that's where we have to stand our ground. But now that we've built the wall to kind of even stop the argument, now let's go ahead and advance the argument and see what people have to say. Here is what was sent to me. This was published back in March of 2019. I guess the person just came across it and they and they sent it to me. I could not tell. I, I, I gave a quick response uh, to the person who sent this to me, and it, it sounds like they didn't like my response. It sounds like that they they were like, no, that's what the Bible says, and they they. It sounds like they weren't very happy that I didn't go, oh, wow, you're right. Um, but I, I have some problems with this. But we'll, we'll see. We're, we're going we're gonna to try to be fair with this, all right? Here is the, the uh, title of the article that was sent to me. Has homosexual always been in the Bible? So has the word homosexual, has it always been in the Bible or was it added at some later time? Now, A lot of this article is going to focus on one Greek word, and the Greek word is this. There we go. Strong's G, 733. Arse no coites. Arse no coites. Arse no coites. 
Arce nikoites. That is the Greek word that they're going to make a big argument about. Arce nikoites. How should this word be translated? Arce nikoites. How should it be translated? And let me just give you some basic background right here before we get even get into the article. Arce nikoites um, is used two times in the King James. All right. Um, it, the King James translates it in the following manner. Abuser of oneself with mankind, defile oneself with mankind. So abuser of oneself with mankind, defile oneself with mankind. All right? So it's used two times. Uh, the Strong's definition um, is a, a sodomite, abuser of that defile self with mankind. Um, under the Blue Letter Bible and under the uh, the interlinear, here is uh, their outline of biblical usage. Uh, Arce nikoites, one who lies with a male as with a female, sodomite, homosexual. All right. The two times that it's used is First Corinthians chapter six verse nine. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, abusers of themselves with mankind is arse nikoites. That's that's how that Greek word is translated there. But please note, before see, they're going to focus right in on uh, Arce Nicoites and make a big argument about, well, see, it, that, that word really has nothing to do with homosexuality. But let's make sure we just look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 carefully. What else is condemned? A fornication is condemned. Sexual immorality, typically fornication, refers to sexual immorality committed before marriage. All right, so there's premarital sex wiped out. Adultery, there is sex in marriage, but not with your marriage partner. And of course, marriage would clearly be understood in the Bibles to be between a male and a female. So just condemning premarital sex, condemning adultery, and then restricting sex to only marriage, you're clearly prohibiting homosexual expression of sex, even if you are argue that arse nikoites should not be translated homosexual and has nothing to do with homosexuality. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 would still restrict where, when and where sexuality could be expressed. But, but the King James expre- uh, translates it, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, this, that's 1 Corinthians 6, 9. The second place this, it's used is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Let me make sure it's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Almost positive. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Yes, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10 reads, For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind defile themselves with mankind is arse nikoites. Arse nikoites is translated there as defile themselves with mankind. Now we could go back to what is a whoremonger? Let's go to, uh, hang on, let's go to, uh, I'm going to go to 1 Timothy 1.10. I'm going to go to all. The first Timothy, okay, hang on, verse 10. Go to interlinear. Let's look up whoremongers. All right, now, um, um, the word here uh, for whoremonger is, is a, it's defined as to sell akin the base, a male prostitute, fornicator, whoremonger. So this is a male who prostitutes his body to another's lust for hire. A male prostitute, a man who indulges in unlawful sexual intercourse. A fornicator. Again, it's a whoremonger. It's it's referring to a male prostitute, but it's still it's still going. It's condemning sexual activity outside of marriage. So even if you argue that the word should not be, tra- it has nothing to do with homosexuality. Even if you make that argument. It's still, it, the passages which the word is found 
offers enough restrictions to build a case against any sexual activity outside of the bonds of marriage. And the marriage would be between a man and a woman, and there's no way to say the Bible would ever argue for anything else. So no matter what the meaning of the word is, no matter what the meaning of the word is, there's already enough there to restrict it that would still make people unhappy. But no, 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 no. They're going to make a big argument about this Greek word. So let's see what they have to say. All right. Yeah, it's just it's just crazy how this kind of uh, thing goes around. All right. They're saying the Greek word shows up in two different verses in the Bible, but it was not translated to mean homosexual until 1946. All right, so they're going to make an argument argument that the word was never translated or meant homosexual until 1946. Before that, no one would have understood that Greek word as condemning homosexuality. All right, now let's do something. I'm going to go back to 1 Corinthians, go back to verse 6, verse 9. Because I just, I just think this is an interesting argument here. Arce nokoites. So, so they're going to say arce nokoites. I'm bringing up the Greek word just in case we need it. Arce nokoites. So their argument is, the word arse nekoite shows up in two different uh, verses in the Bible, but it was not translated to mean homosexual until 1946. So before then, I, so now make sure we understand this. Even the King James doesn't translate it homosexual. All right. So they're going to say after 1946. So I guess any translation after 1946 took the word and translated homosexual. And I'm, I guess the, the argument that's getting ready to be made is then that's when the Bible turned into an anti-gay book. So before that, I guess they're going to make an argument. I mean, I really would love to see this. So you're going to tell me before 1946 that Christianity universally acknowledged and, ex- and accepted homosexuality as a legitimate form to express one's sexuality and allowed for within the church Men to marry men and women to, to marry women. Now, that's a big claim because that's what's kind of being implied here. It's kind of being implied. Hey, did you know that before 1946, hey, the word homosexual didn't show up in the Bible. So, so you know, what happened? Well, here's what they're going to do. The, the author of this article, they sat down with Ed Oxford at his home in Long Beach, California, and talked about this question. Now, I don't, I'm not for sure. I'm, I don't know who Ed o- Oxford is, uh, but let's uh, see what he has to say. This is what they say. You have been a part of, re- of a research team that is seeking to understand how the decision was made to put the word homosexual in the Bible. So a research team has been formed to figure out how the word homosexual showed up in the Bible. Now, remember, we looked up the Strong's definition, sodomite, one who lays, uh, a man who lays with a man like he would, uh, like he would uh, be with a woman. That, that's how Strong's defined it. So, but, you know, hey, let's, according to them, this, this word shouldn't be translated that way, right? So they ask him, I, so you've, you've, you've been a part of a research team seeking to understand uh, how the decision was made to put the word homosexual in the Bible. Is that true? And then Ed Oxford responds, yes, it first showed up in the RSV translation. I think that's the revised standard version. That's the first time it supposedly showed up, RSV translation. So before figuring out why they decided to use that word in the RSV translation, which is outlined in my upcoming book, um, Forging a Sacred Weapon, how the Bible became, became anti-gay. So the name of the book, Forging a Sacred Weapon, How the Bible Became Anti-Gay. Now, I got to just stop right there because the title to me is so, How the Bible Became Anti-Gay. So is the Bible anti-adultery? Is it anti-premarital sex? Is it anti-lust? 
Is it anti-murder? Is it anti-stealing? Is it anti-gossip? Is it anti-gluttony? Is it anti-slothfulness? <laughs> no, it's anti-gay. And t- come on, you purposely state that because that so fits into the, to the spirit of the age. To say something is anti-gay, you're almost arguing that the Bible has been forged into a weapon a weapon of hate, a weapon to use against homosexuals. Well, by that, by that logic, the Bible has been a web, a weapon forged to go after all sexual expression other than that within marriage. It's, it's gone. I mean, it's a, it's a Bible just filled with anti stuff for all kinds of actions. I mean, you're told not, you're not even to love the world or the things in the world. You're just to love God. Oh, I guess it's anti-love. It's anti this, anti that. But no, we use that term anti-gay because it, it makes it sound like the Bible is a hate-filled book. Man, if you're, I, I just, it just blows my mind that there's so much attention to try to get the Bible not to condemn homosexuality. Well, if you're going to get it not to condemn homosexuality, you're going to have to remove all of its condemnation of all sexual activity other than that restricted to marriage. You're going to have to remove the restriction on adultery, remove the restriction on lust, remove the restriction on premarital sex. But no, it's just, we just got to get the the word homosexual out of there and got to make sure everyone realized it was a plot to to put homosexuality in there. All right, let's see what else they have to say. So again, the name of the book, Forging a Sacred Weapon, How the Bible Became Anti-Gay. I wanted to see how other cultures and translations treated the same verses when they were translated during the Reformation 500 years ago. So I started collecting Bibles in French, German, Irish, Gaelic, Polish, you name it. And now I've got most European major languages that I've collected over time. Anyway, I had a German friend come over, uh, a friend come back to town and asked if he could help me with some passages in one of my German Bibles from the 1800s. So uh, we went to Leviticus 18.22. Now, this is interesting because... This, this, the focus here at the beginning of the ar- article is on Arce Nicoites. That's the focus at the beginning, Arce Nicoites. In fact, they argue the word Arce Nicoites shows up in two different verses in the Bible, but it was not translated to mean homosexual until 1946, right? So, but now they're going to start and they're going to Leviticus. Well, first, Leviticus is not in Greek. Arce Nicoites is a Greek word. We're going to the Hebrew now, All right? So, so let's see what they have to say here. So, this person comes back to town. He, uh, he, he's a German friend. Um, he asked him if he could help him with some passages in one of his German Bibles from the 1800s. So we went to Leviticus 18.22. And he's translating it for me uh, word for word. In, in the English where it says, man shall not lie with man for it's an abomination. The German version says, man shall not lie with young boys as he does with a woman, for it is an abomination. I said, what? Are you sure? He said, yes, exclamation point. So they're really emphasizing like, whoa, this is a eureka moment. Whoa, a revelation has just occurred. Then we went to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. Same thing, young boys. So we went to 1 Corinthians to see how they translated our St. Nicoites. And instead of homosexuals, it said, boy molesters will not inherit the kingdom of God. So they're making an argument that what is being condemned in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 is it's a condemnation of molesting a young boy. In other words, it's not condemning sex with a man, like a man having sex with a man. It's only condemning sex between a man and a boy. That's what it's referring to. Now, that's that's the argument. Now, please know a couple of interesting things. They give the actual reference to Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13. They just say, so we went to 1 Corinthians. They don't actually give the chapter and the verse. Now, let me make, let's say, even if this passage, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, which we've already read, let me go back and read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 again. 
Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, there's a couple. So they don't even go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9. I am interested, uh, the word effeminate, the word effeminate, the word effeminate is this word. Strong's G, 3120, Malakas. 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 Now, Malakas means, let's see here, um, effeminate, soft. Uh, it's used four times, and they say it, 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 it's used to mean soft, soft to the touch, uh, and in a bad sense, effeminate, of a boy kept for homosexual relations with a man, of a male who submits his body to unnatural lewdness or of a male prostitute, all right? So you've got two, so in other words, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, you've got two ideas here. You've got the effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind. You've got two words there that would seem to possibly get you to the idea of condemning homosexuality. But let me state it again. Whether you want to put these words referring to homosexual, homosexuals or not, you still have the condemnation of premarital sex and sex out in marriage out, uh, with anyone else other than your marriage partner. And again, you would still be stuck with trying to prove that the Bible allows for homosexual marriage, which obviously we know it did not. We obviously know the church would never have allowed that forever. And churches still don't. Oh, well, there's some churches that do, but okay, you get the idea. So, it's just, I just found it interesting that they didn't bother to give us the actual reference. Now, so even if they're right that, this, that what 1 Corinthians 6, 9 is, is condemning uh, when, when it gets to, the Greek, to that Greek word, that all it's really a, a, a condemning is boy molesters. That's all it's condemning. You still got the effeminate there that you have to deal with. And you still have all the other prohibitions. So that really still doesn't actually get you to where you want to go. But let's go back. They, they, they referred to uh, two passages, Leviticus 18.22. Let's go to Leviticus 18.22. Leviticus 18.22. Leviticus 18.22 reads... Leviticus 18.22, thou shall not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. Seems pretty clear, pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, they argued that the way this should be translated, now please know, what they're doing is he's translating, they're looking at a, uh, a German translation of the Bible. So, so someone, he said they were translating it word for word. So are you translating it from the German into English going, this is the way it should read? Well, wait a minute. What, what we don't need, I don't care what the Greek, I don't care what the German Bible had. I care what the Greek, what the Greek text says. I care what the Hebrew text says. So already this seems like a weird way of going about this, but let me go back and read this to you. So I had a German friend come over. He asked if he could help me with some passages in one of my German Bibles. So we went to Leviticus 18.22, and he's translating it for me word for word. Please note, he's not translating the Hebrew. He's translating the German. So this is already very misleading to go from, to, to start from. And then what he says is, uh, he's translating for, uh, it for me word for word in the English where it says, man shall not lie with man, for it's an abomination. The German version says, man shall not lie with young boys as he does with a woman for it's an abomination. All right. So Leviticus 18.22. Let's go to Leviticus 18.22. Let's go to Leviticus 18.22. Leviticus 18. Let's go down to verse 22. All right. Let's pull up the interlinear. All right. Thou shall not lie with mankind, with mankind, all right, the Hebrew word is... Strong's H, 2145, Zachar, Zachar. All right, Zachar, all right. Now, Zachar, Zachar, you know, Zachar, you can get to try to pronounce it correctly. Um, 
means, let's say it's used 81 times. It's used 81 times. Now, listen to this. It's translated 81 times, 67 times it's used for male, seven times for man, four times for child, two times for mankind, one time for him. All right? So the Strong's definition, um, male of man or animals as being of the most noteworthy sex all right, so some kind, maybe showing some form of superiority. Okay, we could get into a whole discussion there, but that's okay. Him, male, man, and it can be child. So it can refer to a child. Now, their argument is that the way it should be translated is that in Leviticus 18.22, it simply means uh, that man should not lie with young boys. Now, it sounds like to me what it's saying is you should, man should not lie with man like he does with a woman. And it's speaking of a male, like a male should not lie with a male of any age. Man, boy, of any age. That would seem to be the more appropriate way. It can include young boys, but it includes men because the the Hebrew word there is translated male multiple times. So, so they're making a real, they didn't even deal with the actual Hebrew. They're dealing with, well, the, the way it was translated in this uh, German Bible. Well, the German Bible is not the authority. So I, f- I find that interesting. And uh, let me go back here. Because they make an argument here. Say, so thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. Let's look up the word womankind. Let's look up the word womankind. Womankind. Let's see what this word here means. Um, yeah, it can mean uh, woman, adulterer, uh, each, every female. It's translated for uh, 780 times, uh, 425 wife, 324 uh, woman, 10 times one, five times married, two times female. So it doesn't ge- carry the idea of child there, really. Not, I was hoping it would, that it would be like with a woman of any age. But the idea is you're not to lay with a male of any age, of any age like you do with a woman, of any age. It seems to, yes, include laying with a young boy, but it seems to be of any age there. All right, so I think that's interesting. But let's go to the next uh, word from Leviticus they had. Or the next verse in Leviticus. So Leviticus 18.22. Then they jump down to Leviticus 20.13. Leviticus 20.13. Let's go there. Leviticus 20. Leviticus 20. Verse 13. Leviticus 20.13. If a man also lie with mankind. Oh, it's the same. It's, it's Zohar. 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 However you pronounce it. Same, so it's the same word, all right? Same word. And so the same thing in both passages in Leviticus, what is it saying? A man should not lie with a man of any age like he does with a woman. That, that seems, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how you can get around that. I don't know how you can get around that. Like, no, 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 no. That's only referring to you can't lay with young boys. That's, that's all it's referring to. No, it would refer to, listen, it would have to, listen, just think about this logically. It would have to refer to a male of any age because you could not have any physical relations with anyone other than the person you are married to or it would either fall in the category of premarital sex or adultery. All right? And you can't be married, a man can't be married to a man. There's no way you can prove that in the Bible. So so this argument is... It's really, it's really bad. All right, it's really bad. So, all right, let's c- continue on. All right, this is a pretty long article. I want to get as much out of out of the way here as possible. Uh, I then grabbed my uh, copy of Martin Luther's original German translation from 1534. My friend is reading through it for me, and he says, "Ed, this says the same thing. Uh, the The use of the word is boy." Uh, or in, in, in molester, he's giving me the uh, German words and I, I don't know how to pronounce them and I'm not going to try. Uh, the word boy molesters, for the most part, carried uh, through the next several centuries of German Bible translations. So they're like, hey, and, and, and all the German Bible translations, they, they translated it boy molester. Boy, so don't lie with young boys. 
That, that's what was being prohibited. Um, they said in 1 Timothy 1.10, uh, 1 Timothy 1.10, uh, they did the same thing in 1 Timothy 1.10. So the interesting thing is I asked if they ever changed the word to homosexual in modern translation. So my friend found it and told me the first time homosexual appears in a German translation is 1983. Uh, to me, that was a little suspect because of what was happening in culture in the 1970s. Also because the Germans were the ones who created the word homosexual in 1862. They had all the history, research, and understanding to change it if they saw fit. However, they did not change it until 1983. If anyone was going to put the word homosexual in the Bible, the German should have been the first to do it. All right. Um, I was talking with my friend. Um, as I was talking with my friend, I said, I wonder why not until 1983? Uh, was there influence from America? So we had our German connection look into it again. And it turns out that the company uh, Biblica, who owns the NIV version, paid for the 1983 German version. Thus, it was Americans who paid for it um, uh, in 1983. Germans didn't have enough of a Christian population to warrant the cost of a new Bible translation because it's not cheap. So an American company paid for it and influenced the decision, resulting in the word homosexual entering into the German Bible for the first time in history. So I say I think there is a gay agenda after all. Now, We could, you, we, we could, man, how, how do we, how do we handle this? Um, I, cause I want to be fair here. First, if, now this is very important. You, we would have to go back into German. Okay. They're, they're looking at all the German translations. Uh, we would have to go back into history and find out when the word homosexuality begins to really become a, a word of common usage, right? Of common usage. And then we would have to ask ourselves, even though, now this, this, this is the very important question, even though the word homosexuality was not in the Bible, and you're going to argue that these passages spoke of, of condemning lying with a boy, clearly the Hebrew and the Greek uh, carry the idea of condemning more than just lying with a boy. There's no question. There's no way to get around that. They, they, like, they haven't done anything to argue about the Hebrew or the Greek. What they've done is they've argued about how English translations, how German translations translated it young boys, and then all of a sudden it was changed. So here's the thing. Let's say it, it's supposed to say young boys. Let's say that's true. Now, there's no way you can make that argument because uh, we looked up the Greek and the Hebrew and they carry a variety of meanings that go beyond just young boys. It's not like you look it up and it's like young boys, that's the only way it can be translated. Clearly, that's not the case. So, but even if you make an argument that it is to be translated young boys, here comes the real question. Very important. Did the church throughout church history carry the idea that the only thing that was condemned was a man laying with a young boy, or did the church throughout church history condemn homosexuality, the act? And if they did, what did they base it off of? What scriptures were cited by the early, early church to either condemn or excuse homosexuality? Are you telling me nobody in the church condemned homosexuality until 1983? <laughs> No one, no, no, that's when they put the word there. And once they put the word there, then they became anti-gay. No, clearly before 1983, homosexuality was being condemned. Clearly. So I don't know if that would necessarily uh, prove your point. They, they go on to, 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 to state this. I've, I also have a, a 1674 Swedish translation and an 1830 Norwegian translation of the Bible. I asked one of my friends who was attending Fuller Seminary and is fluent in both Swedish and Norwegian to look at the, those verses for me. So we met at a coffee shop in Pasadena uh, with my old Bibles. She didn't really know why I was asking. Just like reading an old English Bible, it's not, uh, it's not easy to read. The letters are a little bit funky. The spelling is a little bit different. So she's going through it carefully, and then her face comes up. Do you know what this says? And I said, no, that's why you're here. She said, it says, boy abusers, 
boy molesters. It turns out that the ancient world condoned and encouraged a system whereby young boys were coupled by older men. Ancient Greek documents shows us how even parents utilize this abusive system to help their sons advance in society. So for the most of history, most translations thought these verses were obviously referring um, to the idea of sleeping with a child, uh, not homosexuality. All right? So um, that's their argument. Now, here's what... um, So they got another thing here. Um, so there, so there is historical tradition to show that these verses aren't relating to homosexuality. The, this person says, absolutely. Sometimes I'm frustrated when I speak with pastors who say, well, I believe the historical tradition surrounding these verses and then proceed with a condemnation of LGBTQ individuals. I challenge them to see what was actually traditionally taught. For most of the history, most European Bibles taught the tradition that these four verses were dealing with, you know, sleeping with children, not homosexuality. I am saddened when I see pastors and theologians cast aside the previous 2,000 years of history. That's why I collect every old Bible, lexicon, theological book, and commentary. Most modern uh, biblical commentaries adjust to accommodate this mistranslation. It's time for the truth to come out. Well, guess what they still haven't worked with? They still haven't dealt with the Hebrew or the Greek. What they've done with is English translations. All right. um, He says, uh, yes, my brother, who is a pastor, also told me the same thing, that every sector of the church has seen same-sex relationships as sinful for 2,000 years. But the more I read and study, though, the more I just don't see this as being true. That's a big claim. Let me do something. I'm going to grab a Bible. I've got it somewhere around me. Give me one second. I hate when I have to do this, but give me one second. I got to find it. I'm right here. One second. One second. I'm right here, I'm right here, right here, right here, right here. All right. I'm very curious about something. All right, let me, I got this right here. Let me look up these passages that they gave us. All right, these four passages. I'm going to look them up in a Bible here. Leviticus 18.22, that's the first one. Leviticus 18.22. Leviticus 18.22. Okay, Leviticus 18.22. You are not to sleep with a man as with a woman. It is detestable. All right, that's how this one translates it. Now, let's see here. No, they do not. I'm looking here. Okay, that does not help me. Let's go to the next one. I'm looking at my ancient faith study Bible, which has commentary from the church fathers. Leviticus 20:13 Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13 Let's see what we have here uh, if a man sleeps with a man as with a woman they they have both committed a detestable act All right That's uh, Leviticus 20:13 and let's see here And they don't have a note here. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9. First Corinthians 6, 9. Yeah, and they have no commentary here as well. It's funny, and we're going to leave any commentary out for these passages that could be somewhat controversial. And then what was the other one? Let's see. Uh, the other one was in First Timothy. Let me see. Do they have it listed here? I can find it by going to the Greek word. Let me go to the Greek word. Let me go back to my interlinear. Give me one second. Let's go to First Corinthians six nine New Testament. First Corinthians six nine. All right. Let's go to the Greek word. And the other one is 1 Timothy 1.10. Yes, 1 Timothy 1.10. I don't think they're going to give us any 
Okay, give me one second. First Timothy 1 10. First Timothy 1 10. Uh, for the sexually immoral and homosexuals, uh, for slave traders, liars, so it condemns it. Okay, and let's see here. And of course, no notes. All right, so the ancient faith study Bible just avoids the controversy like the plague. Let's do something here. One second, uh, one second. Early fathers. I'm just going to do something really, really quick here on. Because they're trying to argue that. Uh, okay, here. All right, we have a quote here from the Didache. That's what I was looking for, from the Didache. Now, the Didache, 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 um, is one of the earliest uh, writings. And it says this, uh, the Didache says, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit, and then they have, let's see here, uh, fornication, practice magic, witchcraft, shall not murder a child by abortion, nor kill one that has been born. All right. So does not uh, use the word uh, homosexuality there. All right. Let me see here. Here's Justin Martyr. Okay. Let me see here. I'm looking at some quotes here. All right. Here's Clement of Alexandria. All right. I'm looking to see uh, the fate of the sodomites was judgment. Those who have done wrong instruction to those who hear the sodomites having though much luxury fallen into uncleanliness, practicing adultery shamelessly and burning with inane, insane love for boys. All right. So that idea, um, Sodom to be burned. Okay. I'm looking, I'm not finding a lot of quotes here that will help us. Uh, Basil the Great says, he who is guilty of unseemliness with males will be under uh, discipline for the same at a time as adulterers. All right, that seems to be uh, definitely a reference to uh, homosexuality. I don't see how you can uh, get there. Okay. Um, um, uh, all these of uh, this is John uh, Chrysostom. All these afflictions were vile. He's uh, referencing Romans one twenty six through twenty seven. But chiefly the mad lust after males, for the soul is more the sufferer in sins and more dishonored than the body in disease. The men have done an insult to nature itself, and yet more disgraceful thing than, than there is than the, these is it. When even the women seek after these intercourses, who ought not, uh, who ought to have more shame than men. All right, so that seems to uh, go again. And here's Augustine: those shameful acts against nature, such as were committed in Sodom ought everywhere and always to be detested and punished. All right, so in other words, you definitely have some of the church fathers speaking against going after uh, the young boys. That seemed to be something that was very prevalent in that culture at time. But you also have the church fathers who expanded it to speak of, you know, men with men, women and women, and 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 the actions of the sodomites. And they used that term. So I, I think the problem is to argue, well, these, these English trans, or these, not English translations, these German translations, Swedish translations, these Norwegian translations, they use, they speak about this referring to young boys. That doesn't prove your point. First, you didn't, nowhere do they deal with the Greek or the Hebrew. They don't deal with that. We go to the Greek and Hebrew and make it very clear that that expands it beyond just young boys. All right, so that's that's fair. Now, I now make this very clear. If this is very important, I no English translation should put the word homosexual if the Greek and the Hebrew does not support it. 
If it doesn't support it, then don't use the word. If they didn't even really have a, I mean, the word homosexual obviously probably didn't even exist at that time. So you've got to use whatever the best way to translate it. The King James doesn't use the word homosexual. So you can't accuse it of of being anti-gay as far as, oh, they put the word there. But it's very clear that the Hebrew and the Greek goes beyond just the actions of it's condemning Male with male, that's, you can't do that. A man can't lay with a man of any age, including boys, as with a female. That seems to be a very fair and even-handed way of handling the word. Now, here comes down to the issue. You can argue all day with people about this. You can argue and argue and argue and argue and argue. It comes down to this. You start with Genesis, you go to Revelation, and you're like, the totality of Scripture lays down a sexual morality, a sexual ethic. Now, e- now, listen, you either are going to agree with it or you're going to disagree with it. And if you disagree with it, then you have to just abandon the Bible or you agree with it and you either have to say, I'm going to try my best to abide by it. I may fall short. If I fall short, I'm going to repent. I'm going to try to follow Christ. I'm going to ask for forgiveness. It, even if you fall short of it, you don't change it just because you fall short of it. You don't change it just because you don't like it. You don't change it because you believe it's no longer in, it's no longer in, you know, it, it no longer works with the times in which we live. It's not, it's, it's not Plato. It's the word of God. It's not for us to, to just mold and shape into any form we want. And it doesn't matter what the issue is. Doesn't matter if it's divorce, doesn't matter what the issue is. If you don't like it, your job is to submit to it, even though you don't like it. And if you're not going to submit to it, and all you're going to do is sit there and try to change it and come up with every, I mean, look, we just read an article where the argument was how the German Bible translates it. Look at how the German Bible translates it. That proves something. No, the Greek and Hebrew is what we need. Now, why did the German translators use use that? I don't know. They didn't provide us any context to explain why the German translators did it that way. I don't know. But that's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. We do have the ability to look at the Greek and Hebrew and go, okay, I think I think we can make a case here. Homosexuality. We use that term homosexuality. We use the term, we'll use the term this way. Clearly, the principle of a man laying with a man as with a woman is clearly applicable to these passages of scripture as well as not not lying with a young boy. Both are in, included in uh, the understanding of how these phrases are used. I think that is fair. And if you don't like it, you can leave Christianity. No one's forcing you in it, but don't sit there and try to change it just so that you can fulfill your lust and your desire. There are things in the Bible that condemns me. I can't change the Bible I have to either submit to the Bible or abandon it completely. Those are my options. Changing it doesn't, look, you can change it and you can pretend all day. It's not going to make it go away. All right, I'll stop right there. That took a lot longer than I wanted, but um, that's some very important information. And uh, I, I I I just wanted to bring it to you. I don't know how prevalent that article is. Um, If you, if you want me to, I may post the article. I may post the article under the theologycentral.net blog, theologycentral.net. I may try to get it posted there uh, because um, I think I think people should see it. Um, and 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 I know I had to do a really quick, a really quick view through the uh, through the church fathers. I had to kind of go through that really quick. I wish I could have spent more time with the church fathers. It seems like Augustine was probably the most blunt about it. Um, others. It seemed like they definitely were more that clearly there was something going on with uh, men lying with young boys at that time. And clearly a lot of the church fathers put their em- emphasis at that. But we would have to ask ourselves, I wonder how widespread was the practice of homosexuality at the time? I mean, I don't know. There, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions. So, all right, I'll stop there. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, I tried to go through that as fast as I could, but that's a lot to work through. So. All right, email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. We'll return to this subject if we need to. This will at least place the problem before you, and you can do your own research and your own study to see what you think. All right, I'll stop right there. Everyone have a great day. God bless.